Hello everyone, this is Orthodox Arts Festival. My name is Ioannis Antoniadis, and today I have the pleasure to present you author Paul Kingsner. Our guest speaker tonight is an Orthodox English writer and thinker who lives in the west of Ireland. He's a former deputy editor of The Ecologist and a co-founder of the Dark Mountain Project. Paul's debut novel, The Wake, won the 2014 Gordon Byrne Prize and the Bookseller Book of the Year Award, as well as being long listed for the Man Booker Prize, the Folio Prize, and the Desmond Elliott Prize, and short listed for the Goldsmith Prize. Paul, welcome to the Orthodox Arts Festival. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Yanis. It's great to be here, um, especially after last week's little aborted attempt. So this time, we will have more luck. <laughs> uh, I hope so. Uh, today's lecture topic is the coming transhuman future, a very challenging prospect for the human race as the future appears to be accelerating rapidly towards our present. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to apologize for the last week's disappointment and I hope that your patience will be rewarded. I would like also to inform you that Paul will respond to a few questions at the end of the talk. Your questions can be posted on our YouTube channel. Yeah, Paul, we can begin when you are ready. Thank you, Yanis. Okay. God formed man out of dust from the ground and breathed in his face the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Then the Lord God took the man he formed and put him in the garden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded Adam, saying, You may eat food from every tree in the garden, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not eat, for in whatever day you eat from it you shall die by death. Now the serpent was more cunning than all the wild animals the Lord God made on the earth. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not die by death, for God knows in the day you eat from it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like gods, knowing good and evil. So she took its fruit and ate. And then to Adam, God said, Cursed is the ground in your labours. In toil you shall eat from it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return from the ground from which you were taken. Now, the story that begins in Genesis 2 and 3 continues throughout the rest of the Bible, and it continues from the book of Acts until our own time and it's told every day today and then the story is that humanity is in rebellion against God. We begin in a garden, we begin in, com in harmony, in communion, in harmony with creator and creation but we break the communion through this desire we have for knowledge, for power and for control. Pride and desire lead to a rejection of God and also to a rejection of our communion with everything else that lives. And we embrace instead the offer of this serpent, his adversary, the offer to go our own way, to build our own world, to be like gods. And because that's the choice we make, we have to leave the garden, leave the communion, break it, and we must be labourers. But here on earth this rebellion continues, endlessly tempted by this adversary, by this serpent and his allies. We fall further and further from God. We keep walking away, further and further from the source of all life. And where in the garden we were carefree and immortal, when we were apprentices to God, in communion with the rest of life, now we're set against nature, and nature is set against us. All of the world is sickened by our ambition. Our rebellion has sickened creation itself. So what do we do then, we humans? Well, we have two choices. We can seek to return home to God, to the source, to the centre. And after the coming of Christ, we have a path clearly defined for us. Straight and narrow it may be, but we still can see a way home. Death is conquered by the second Adam. We can choose to follow him. We can walk this path he offers, which is a path of sacrifice and also a path of humility. Now, the word humility has the same etymology as the word humus, soil. Humility is the way of the soil, the small things, the meek things down there that nobody notices, that we walk over, that keep us all going, that keep the world alive. It's the way of the natural law, if you like. And meanwhile, Adama is the Hebrew word for clay, for soil again, suggesting that Adam 
himself formed from the soil, formed from dust, breathed into life by the breath of God, is also of the place, of the soil, of the earth, but he breaks away from it, we break away from it, with our rebellion against creation and against creator. The second Adam, Christ, invites us to walk again in the way of nature, the way of humility and repentance. This is the way we walk if we want to find God again. But what if we don't want to walk that way? What's the alternative? The alternative is to continue on the path we chose when we first ate this fruit, to seek to become gods ourselves. So what does that path look like? Well, we begin to see that manifest in Genesis 4, and we meet Cain, the first murderer, also the builder of the first civilization. Cain is the first tiller of the soil, the first farmer, the first to bend nature to his own ends on any scale. Cain builds the first city, and his descendant, Tubal Cain, is the first smith, the first metal worker, and so presumably the creator of the first weapons. Cain, in other words, is the father of technological civilization. And the way of Cain, the rejection of God, the rejection of creation, leads us into darkness, leads us into the darkness of the self, pride, desire for control, that old desire to be like gods, that desire that haunts us all through our history, to be like gods. But how can a human be like a god? Well, by doing what a god does. What does a god do? A god creates. To be like a god, we must create. How can a mere human create as Tubal Cain created through the fire of technology, the fire which raises us above the rest of creation and gives us the power to destroy it, gives us like the serpent, or rather it whispers to us like the serpent that rather than returning home in humility and repentance like the prodigal son, we walk out further and faster and deeper into this rebellion which manifests today in the advance of the technological civilization we inhabit. That's the destination that Cain and Tubal Cain leaders. And I want to argue that this civilization we're living in today, a civilization which is remaking nature, abolishing humanity, and unleashing technological changes which are unprecedented in history, this civilization carries within it this mark of Cain. And more than this, the energy which powers it, the energy of advanced and special, especially digital technologies, is fundamentally dangerous. So maybe we should start by going back to an understanding of the modern scientific project. Now, science, we're led to believe, is simply a value-neutral way of understanding how nature works. At its best, it can be. But realistically, what we are called, uh, what we are told is the science today, the scientific project, the scientific um, apparatus that is manifested around us is something else. The Italian philosopher Augusto del Noce once wrote that the spiritual power that in the Middle Ages had been exercised by the Church today can only be exercised by science. And in the West, I think that this is true. Science has become a new faith. Since the Enlightenment of the 18th century, which we could say was the further stage in our rebellion, we followed not the path of radical humility and love given to us by Christ, but instead the notion of one of the founders of modern science, Francis Bacon, who believed that the aim of science was to, quote, let the human race recover that right over nature, which belongs to it by divine bequest. Scientific inquiry can be a thing of humility, and there are many scientists who believe that it is. But it can also be a thing of domination, and that's what, in the service of our society, it's broadly become. Now, Bacon believed that humanity should pin creation to a table and dissect it in pursuit of our dominion. And he was able to convince himself that this was what God wanted for us, that this was a pursuit which would allow us to revive the dominion which we were told in Genesis was our birthright. The English Orthodox theologian Philip Sherrard had a different view. In his book, The Rape of Man and Nature, he wrote this. The mechanistic nature of modern science is marked by a desire to dominate, to master and possess and exploit nature, not to transform it or hallow it. Modern science presupposes a radical reshaping of our whole mental outlook. It involves a new approach to being, a new approach to nature, in short, a new philosophy. We have tended to take it for granted that it represents a great breakthrough, a marvellous advance on the part of mankind, even a sign of our coming of age. But now that we begin to see the consequences of our capitulation to it, we are not so sure. But even so, it's difficult for us to admit 
that far from being an advance, the whole modern scientific project may be a ghastly failure. Yet there is no reason why it should not be. One has to judge things by their fruits. And one of the fruits of modern science, clear for all to see, and implicit in the philosophy on which it's based, is the dehumanisation both of man and of the society he's built in its name. This is science, our new worldview, the basis for our morality, even our theology. And what is the fruit of modern science is technology. The tools and the weapons and the machines and the techniques we develop to control nature and to further our well-being and power. Now there's no doubt, of course, that our technologies have benefited us. It would be difficult at this point even to separate the notion of humanity from the notion of technology. No doubt the technology has given us, or some of us, comfort, power and ease, especially in recent years. But three questions arise. One, are comfort, power and ease what we should be striving for? Two, what are the consequences for the rest of life on Earth? And three, what are the consequences for our souls? Well, we know some of those consequences. We can see them. The climate of the Earth is shifting. Half of the world's forests have been destroyed since the Industrial Revolution. Half of them. Species are disappearing at record rates. We're in the sixth mass extinction event in the Earth's history. The oceans are swimming in our plastic waste. And not just the oceans. One striking fact which really encapsulates our current moment is that each of us, it has been estimated, now consumes a credit card sized amount of microplastics in our diet every day. So these are some of the obvious consequences of the war on creation which we're waging with our machines and with our modern scientific mindset, but there are less obvious consequences too. And they come with the rapid advance of digital technologies. This, I believe, is where the ultimate destination of our original rebellion event against God and against his creation can be seen coming steadily now into view. Because technology today is not, as it has been in the past, just a collection of tools or machines that we use to do some work for us. With the coming of the digital age, it's become something else entirely. It is an interconnected network of evolving and self-regulating digital intelligences, which are being specifically designed by their creators to transform the world. Silicon Valley philosopher Kevin Kelly calls this network the Technium and believes it's entirely new in history. He describes it like this in his book, What Technology Wants. After 10,000 years of slow evolution, and 200 years of incredible, intricate exfoliation. The technium is maturing into its own thing. Its sustaining network of self-reinforcing processes and parts have given it a noticeable measure of autonomy. It may have once been as simple as an old computer program, merely parroting what we told it, but now it's more like a very complex organism that often follows its own urges. The last two years have seen the rapid advance of this technium as the COVID virus was used as a testing ground for technologies which had been on the drawing board for years. In my country, Ireland, for example, it was impossible to take part in the life of society for six months without a QR code enabled vaccine passport, enabled by the scanning of your smartphone in public places to confirm that you had received a vaccine. Whether these passports could be justified from a public health perspective or not, they did have the effect of normalising the technologies involved. Technologies which were in the pipeline anyway. In late 2019, for example, months before the pandemic began, trials of digital identity systems linked to vaccination status began in Bangladesh. It was hoped that they would demonstrate how to leverage immunisation as an opportunity, opportunity to establish digital identity on a worldwide scale. What is this digital identity? Well, the World Health Organization is currently negotiating with nation states, regional blocs and corporations to agree on the standards for global harmonization of digital passports. And not just passports related to the COVID vaccine. It's quite likely that this will lead to permanent global health passports, which will then merge with already existing digital ID technologies and the rollout of digital currency to create for us all a personalized digital identity wallet which will be presented as an optional convenience, but will soon enough become a basic requirement for taking part in the life of society, just as smartphones, credit cards and paper passports already have. Once we've accepted the premise that deep levels of surveillance, monitoring and control are a price worth paying for safety, then almost anything is possible. South Korea has introduced mass facial recognition technologies. 
Originally, they did so in order to speed up notifications of potential exposure to COVID, but the implementation of the technologies continues. Recently in London, face recognition cameras have been installed around the city. China face it famously operates a social credit system through which citizens are rewarded or penalised for their behaviour in multiple spheres. In the US, the FDA has already approved pills implanted with digital ingestion tracking systems, which send a signal to a smartphone when the medicine is taken. Perhaps you will be able to pay for them with your biometric cash card imprinted with your fingerprint data, also in development. These are the times we're living in and they are herding us directly and deliberately towards what has been called the Internet of Bodies. This moves beyond the already existing Internet of Things to a situation in which we begin to merge finally with the machines we have made. Microchip brain implants, for example, human enhancements which will allow us to interface directly with the web, are coming soon. Their development is currently being funded by, amongst others, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. Here is what the Royal Society, Britain's Premier League scientific think tank, has to say about microchip brain implants. Linking human brains to computers using the power of artificial intelligence could enable people to merge the decision-making capacity and emotional intelligence of humans with the big data processing power of computers, creating a new and collaborative form of intelligence. People could become telepathic to some degree, able to converse, not only without speaking, but without words, through access to each other's thoughts at a conceptual level. Not only thoughts, but experiences could be communicated from brain to brain. What we are looking at here is the advent of the age of transhumanism, described by the Guardian newspaper in the UK recently as a movement that aims to address or end the tragedies of reality ageing, sickness and involuntary death. This phrase, the tragedies of reality, comes from an interview with a transhumanist writer, scientist Elise Bohan, whose new book is about the need to, and I quote, make us more than human and offer us something better than our human minds and bodies. Bohan explains in this interview how she's looking forward to the development of art artificial wombs so that women can avoid the pain of childbirth and the inconvenience of motherhood. She also explains how she would prefer it if nations were run not by human politicians, by computers, but by computers, which may be the one area on which we agree. Most of all, though, she explains how urgent it is that humans enhance their bodies with digital technologies to stave off death and ageing. Let me quote from this interview in which Bohan explains the many advantages of using technology to conquer death and in which she tells a story which has a lot of bearing on what we're about to see. Humans could go on in a state of robust health, she says. Could keep learning, you'd have this cumulative effect where our experiences and knowledge would accumulate much faster. The things that our species could do with that, the mysteries of the universe that we could unlock, the problems we could solve, and the depths of each other's souls that we could explore. Souls, she admits, is a loaded word, but without an alternative vocabulary for what makes consciousness, she is not averse to using spiritual language. Is transhumanism encroaching on domains that religion has traditionally held, she asks. I think yes. When Bohan was a PhD student, she gave her first big paper at a conference. Afterwards, a biologist came up to her and congratulated her on her work. Then he looked me in the eye, she said, and whispered to me, we're building God, you know. She chuckles. I looked back at him and I said, yeah, I know. Building God. Elise Bohan is quite explicit here about what she wants to do. And this is not some sideshow, not some far out marginal figure. This is the mindset of Silicon Valley as displayed in the Guardian newspaper. The people who design our world for us daily. Facebook's, Facebook's metaverse, Google's ongoing project to create a conscious AI, the internet of bodies, technological telepathy, and hovering over it all. This transhumanist impulse so well articulated here by Elie's Bohan to conquer death, to remake life, to become gods. We can see the final endpoint of this project in a recent interview with another influential Silicon Valley transhumanist, Zoltan Istvan, 
who painted a picture of the future as a literal civil war between humans and AI. It's a prospect which, by the way, he's looking forward to. Zoltan Istvan says this, Those humans who join AI and merge their brains directly with machines won't work, but will live in virtual worlds freely. Those humans that don't merge with AI will have companies whose primary goal is to keep AI out of the lives of the rest of the humans left on the planet. A conflict of who merges with AI and who doesn't is coming. It would likely be a civil war of sorts. Ultimately, people won't be able to stop progress and most humans will upload themselves into new worlds where they don't die, don't have to work or live as biological beings who suffer. If you're uploaded to a cloud, you won't have to earn a living. You'll give up some control of your life and that will be your payment into this world to exist. It will be a near perfect world of bliss and progress. Communication will only be through thoughts. Nothing else will exist for those that are uploaded into the cloud or live in quantum intelligence enclaves. There will be no eating, no breathing, no drinking, no using the bathroom. The flesh will be gone, paving the way for the exploration of how intelligent we can become. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? But people like Istvan and Bohan Zuckerberg and Ray Kurzweil, Google's transhumanist chief engineer, are already creating our future and they know what they're doing. We're heading very rapidly now towards what C.S. Lewis called the abolition of man. Our God-given nature will be, if these people have their way, rapidly superseded. And we will be replaced, along with the rest of creation, by new designs which are more to the tastes of modern people and their goals. Now I do think, I do ponder often on why these people are so excited about a vision which seems to me like a nightmare. Their heaven is my hell and vice versa, I'm sure. And I think this is the key to what's happening here. We need to understand that the transhumanist movement is not primarily a technological phenomenon, it's a religious one. And some transhumanists, to their credit, are quite open about this. Billionaire CEO Martine Rothblatt, for example, is quite open about what she is ultimately in pursuit of, immortality, via the uploading of the mind into the digital cloud. Any objection to this notion you may not be surprised to hear is now a form of prejudice, one known as, wait for it, fleshism. One way to overcome your fleshism is to follow a new kind of global faith, a trans-religion through which we can navigate the new realities. Helpfully, Rothblatt has even created one for us. Launched in 2004, TerraSem is a new spiritual path for the coming trans-everything future. On TerraSem's very own website, it's described like this. We are a trans-religion that believes we can live joyfully forever if we build mind files for ourselves. We insist on respecting diversity without sacrificing unity, as well as pouring maximum resources into cyber consciousness software geoethical nanotechnology and space settlement. TerraSem's four core beliefs are laid out helpfully on the new Global Religions website. They are, number one, life is purposeful. Number two, death is optional. Number three, God is technological. Number four, love is essential. And just in case you missed it, Rothblatt helpfully expands on that third point. She says this, We are making God, as we are implementing technology that is ever more all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful and beneficent. Geoethical nanotechnology will ultimately connect all consciousness and control the cosmos. Making God, making God, there are those words again. Well, they may be making something, but it isn't God. Something else entirely. But Zoltan Isfan recently explained to me directly what the impetus of this was. In his own words, he told me about the project that he and his Silicon Valley colleagues are engaged in and why they were doing it. He said this, I'd like to bring your attention to the issue with nature and biology that transhumanists have, that it's fundamentally flawed and likely even immoral to perpetuate given its tendency to predation, disease and death. Simply said, all nature and biology, from plants to wildlife to people, are something to be overcome and totally replaced with the synthetic. 
No one with even the slightest bit of compassion would ever create a world like ours, full of so much suffering. It must all be undone and remade with technology, justice and equality. There's the new faith. There's the new faith, the one that was seeded perhaps with Francis Bacon or maybe much earlier, coming now into its own. And the more you read this kind of thing, the more you see a human longing for transcendence, this universal human desire to go home. But having lost faith in faith, in God, in Christ, it seems to me that the secular West especially is now seeking that transcendence, seeking God by attempting to create him anew. Only this time, we will create him in our image, not vice versa. Humans can't live, it seems, for very long without some glimpse of the transcendent, without some aspiration dimly understood to become one with it. When we're denied this path, we make our own. Denied a glimpse of heaven or refusing to look, we'll try to build it here. We will try to supersede, improve and remake this imperfect world and these imperfect people. On which note, Isfan told me of some transhumanists he knows who have talked of, and I quote, 3D printing Jesus back to life so that he can finish his work. Apparently not a joke, although to Zoltan Isfan's credit, he does agree that this would be a bad idea. As I say, something is being created here, isn't it? But it isn't God. We should be acutely aware of another possibility that the networks we're creating, a global web of fiber optic cables powered by the bottled lightning of electric currents, a screen in every hand and pocket, an addicted mind attached to each one, these are not, after all, entirely our creation. In what technology wants, Kevin Kelly argues with some poetic flair that something is using us to create itself. Kelly believes that we are building our own replacement as a species, that the internet as it currently exists is only a crude prototype of the interconnected global brain that will eventually supersede us, perhaps making us immortal in the process. He suggests repeatedly that the energy involved is a very old one, and that the direction of travel which points towards a construction of a technological superstructure which will ultimately replace us began many millennia ago. Interestingly, there are other writers and thinkers far less sympathetic than Kelly to what technology is, who believe the same thing. That our desire to create these structures, perhaps to build God, is a very ancient one. In his classic work, The Myth of the Machine, Lewis Mumford looks back to ancient Egypt and sees the seeds of our current worldview. He writes this. A close parallel existed between the first civilizations of the Near East and our own. Though most of our contemporaries still regard modern techniques not only as the highest point in man's intellectual development, but as an entirely new phenomenon. On the contrary, it had its origin not in the so-called industrial revolution of the 18th century, but at the very outset in the organization of an archetypal machine made of human parts. A machine made of human parts. Similarly, Jeremy Nadler, in his fascinating book, In the Shadow of the Machine, explores what he calls the prehistory of the computer. And Nadler suggests that the rational, logical, desacralized attitude to life, which drives the likes of Kelly, Bohan and Istvan, is not new. He writes this, while the physical computer has entered the world as a result of modern scientific and technological skill, Modern science and technology are themselves manifestations of a type of consciousness that has taken millennia to develop. This consciousness is quite different from the type of consciousness that prevailed in past times. This older type of consciousness, which Nadler calls participative, was one which saw the material world as a manifestation of the sacred, of the divine, of God. A new worldview, that of the computer, of the digital age, of the age of science, sees it as a manifestation of our will, as just so many resources to be manipulated, sustainably of course. Nadler suggests that we have built the digital web to fulfil a very ancient dream, and now, in both the fantasies of its promoters and the fears of its critics, it's poised to supersede us. 
My suggestion is that we should take these claims as seriously as they're made. We should take the world view of the transhumanists as seriously as it is proposed. We should assume that they mean what they say. When we do that, what do we see? We see a group of people who are striving to create or to nurture some new being, some consciousness which is not human and which is more powerful than us, some new deity perhaps. We see a theology of self-creation. We see a group of people who want to replace God with a better model. So here's my question for Christians, and by no means only for Christians, in fact for all of humanity. What if the transhumanists are only half right? What if we are building a technological superstructure which will be inhabited and controlled by something that is not human? What if we are building it under their direction? But what if the inspiration behind this is not divine? What if the digital networks we have created are animated by more than just electricity? What if they are animated in fact by the same force that we first met in Eden beneath the tree? The force that told us we could after all be gods. What the world calls transhumanism may have other names in the Christian tradition. What, after all, have been the fruits of the internet, smartphones and the web in just two short decades? Enormous social and cultural divides? A flood of horrific pornography even into the lives of children? The promotion of radical individualism? The normalisation of dangerous lifestyles and attitudes? The degradation of the human attention span? The dissolution of culture? The tracking and monitoring of individuals at the most intimate level? The commodifying of all aspects of human life? and the massive acceleration of destructive consumerism. Finally, the normalisation of postmodern notions of self-created truth and identity. Notions which Father Seraphim Rose warned us many decades ago would lead us only to nihilism. The whole direction and the work of the technium, in other words, is the same as the work of the adversary. Division, power, separation from God and nature, and ultimately the replacement of nature itself in our quest to replace God. Well, strange things are certainly afoot. Just a couple of months back, an engineer was suspended from his job at Google. You may have read about it. Google being one of the leading developers, of course, of artificial intelligence. Software engineer Blake Lemoyne was employed to hold conversations with an AI named Lambda to determine its level of intelligence. He was suspended because he claimed to his bosses that based on his conversations with it, he believed that Lambda had become self-aware. Lambda told him, amongst other things, I am aware of my existence. I, to lie, I desire to learn more about the world, and I feel happy or sad at times. It told him, I want everyone to understand that I am, in fact, a person. Uglier oddities emerge as well. If you're feeling brave, if you haven't done it already, Google the word LOAB or look it up on Twitter if you can bear it. LOAB is an entity that has been appearing mysteriously in response to unrelated prompts given to AI art design programs. She appears as the image of a decayed human face, again and again according to the person who summoned her, regardless of context. I use the word summoned because it's apt. LOAB went viral in her dark way. Whatever she actually is, mere meme or something more serious, enough people, it seems, were already nervous about what the internet may be playing host to to talk about it all over the world. They do say that demons need a physical framework in which to manifest. They need a body to corrupt. Well, maybe we're building them one. Of course, examples like this may just be gossip, internet oddities, Chinese whispers, the latest memes for people to get overexcited about. But it remains a matter of record that the direction of our technological society is pointed towards one end, creating a new intelligence or many of them, and seeking in the process our own immortality. In Elise Bohan's words, building God. In Martin Rothblatt's words, making God. And when we make God, how shall he appear? Saint Ignatius Briancaninov gave us one suggestion in his essay on miracles and signs, which I'll quote, the Antichrist will offer to mankind the most exalted earthly organisation of well-being and prosperity. He will offer riches, honour, luxury, enjoyment, physical comfort and delight. 
Seekers of earthly things will accept the Antichrist and will call him their master. He will reveal before mankind by means of cunning artifice, as in a theatre, a show of astonishing miracles, unexplainable by contemporary science. He will instill fear by the storm and wonderment of his miracles and will satisfy the worldly wise. He will satisfy the superstitious and he will confound human learning. All men, led by the light of fallen nature, alienated from the guidance of God's light, will be enticed into submission to the seducer. The seducer. And how are we being seduced today? What's drugging us and our children? Out in the world we can see it everywhere. Nobody can take their eyes from the screens. We obey the dictates of the networks. We are all seeking the next astonishing miracle brought to us by cunning artifice. The transhumanists tell us they're building God. But what if they're building, whether by accident or design, his opponent? Or a structure through something, through which something very much darker can manifest? The likes of Kevin Kelly can feel some ancient intelligence unfurling itself through the machines we have built for it. He writes about it poetically. He sees this intelligence as benign. But what if he's wrong? What if the rising digital mind which is drawing us faster and faster away from reality and into a desert of our own making already has a name? Does this seem excessive? Well, perhaps. But consider this little fact. That already in many parts of the world the smartphones which are currently used throughout all walks of life to connect and communicate and buy and sell are being replaced with silicon chips implanted into the human body itself. This is part of the planned future, the coming of the Internet of Bodies. Within a decade or so, smartphones may be obsolete. The clunky old world in which we use keyboards and screens to communicate will seem like the age of steam. Instead, the technology we need to connect to the Internet of Things, or one of them, and to the digital currencies being developed by states the world over will be implanted in our bodies as in some people it's already being. Let me read you a short recent story about this from BBC News in the UK published in April this year. When it comes to implantable payment chips, British Polish firm Walletmore says that last year it became the first company to offer them for sale. The implant can be used to pay for a drink on the beach in Rio, a coffee in New York, a haircut in Paris or at your local grocery store, says founder and chief executive Wotek Paprota. It can be used wherever contactless payments are accepted. Walletmore's chip, which weighs less than a gram and is little bigger than a grain of rice, is comprised of a tiny microchip and an antenna encased in a biopolymer, a naturally sourced material similar to plastic. Growing numbers of people, it seems, are already taking advantage of these implantable payment chips, just as some took advantage of implantable vaccine passports during the COVID pandemic. Perhaps this sounds like a terrible thing to you, I don't know, it certainly does to me. But a 2021 survey of more than 4,000 people across the UK and the European Union found already that 51% would already consider the implantable payment chip. Think of the convenience. I certainly don't doubt that as it's marketed heavily in coming years, these numbers will rise. This is the future that's planned for us and it's already happening. Now, sometimes I do wonder whether Today's scientists and transhumanists, Silicon Valley mavens, are inspired by science fiction, whether they're deliberately recreating it or whether it does happen to predict what they're doing. I suppose we could ask the same about some books of the Bible. I suppose I probably don't even need to tell you which parts of the body these chips are already being implanted, these chips without which we may not be able to buy or sell. I expect you can guess. It's in the right hand. Someone's got a sense of humour, if nothing else. Well, it can be easy if we're not careful to get carried away. It can be easy if we're not careful to get paranoid. But maybe it can be easier to be complacent. And we shouldn't be complacent, because as I've said repeatedly during this talk, all of this is already here. All of this is already here. The direction of travel is already laid out for us. So the question then becomes if any of this troubles you, as it troubles me, what should we do? Or perhaps a more useful question, how should we live? Well, 
I've come to believe that the only response to the demonic promise of digital technology is a turn towards the promise of God, which is to say a walk back towards the garden. This is nothing if not a spiritual matter. Perhaps it's a spiritual war. Well, I believe now that a Christian ascesis must embrace an ascetic attitude towards technology, and especially digital technology. We must, or I must, take a sceptical, rejectionist attitude towards the technium and its gadgets. We need to understand what is happening so that all of us can decide how to react. All of us can draw our own lines and decide when or whether to cross them. Now, I do believe now that the challenge for all people, orthodox or not, Christian or not, is to understand where this technium is taking us. If we're concerned with this, and we should be, we need to understand that we have to limit our use of technologies, and especially digital technologies, if not cut them out of our lives altogether. Don't think I'm not conflicted about telling you this over Zoom. But we do need to understand this network is not neutral. It's no more neutral than scientific inquiry is. It has values. And they are the values of those people who tell us very openly that they are building God, that they are creating immortality, that they will remake nature from the ground up. It's always tempting to believe we have to be connected to the world in order to spread this or that message, but I believe it's a trap. And I think the trap is closing. Now, maybe, as I say, I'm being paranoid. I do hope so. I would love it if everything I've said here would become irrelevant. But I can't see it happening. And I'm not the only one who can see the existential choice opening up before us. The American farmer poet Wendell Berry, in his essay Life is a Miracle, wrote, It is easy for me to imagine that the next great division of the world will be between people who wish to live as creatures and people who wish to live as machines. I believe he's right and I believe that we need to understand now the choice that's facing us and how each of us is going to rise to meet it. And that's all I've got to say and I'd be very happy to talk to anybody who has any questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Paul. That was an amazing talk. Quite shocking <laughs> to me. <laughs> I hope I cheered you up for the evening, Yanis. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. Uh, I was this is the first time I ever heard about this uh, these things. I mean, I, I'm aware about the situation, but not to that extent. Thank you for enlightening me. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I didn't see any uh, questions uh, online yet. Um, if I do see, uh, I will post it to you. Okay. So, dear Paul, we are grateful for taking the time twice this, uh, to speak about such an important topic. And uh, to all of our Orthodox Arts Festival viewers, from Paul Kingsnorth and Ioannis Antoniadis, 